have two uh, guests. I believe that Crystal Ng is going to be giving most of the presentation. She's joined by her collaborator on this project, Dr. Chan Lan Chung. Uh, as they'll explain, there are several other University of Minnesota faculty members involved in this project as well. So let me just introduce uh, Crystal and Chan Lan to you briefly. Um, Crystal is an associate pr uh, professor in our Department of Earth Sciences here. She's interested in how different aspects affecting the hydrologic cycle, including the atmosphere, plants, soil, microbial activity, and geochemistry in, all interact with each other. And this has given her the opportunity to work on a wide range of different problems. Uh, just to name a few here, she's been investigating soil crop and climate controls and groundwater recharge in semi-arid semi areas, such as the High Plains, has done eco-hydrological modeling of vegetation vulnerability and resilience in the Mojave Desert, and has assessed data assimilation methods for chaotic models of the atmosphere, uh, as well as describing chemical, mineral, and microbial transport processes that affect groundwater quality here in Minnesota, as well as in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Most, uh, what, what, one of her recent areas of research, which we'll hear, hear more about, are the uh, interactions of, of these various cycles as they affect the stands of native wild rice in northern Minnesota. And Chan Lan Chung uh, will be joining uh, uh, to address questions as well as perhaps part of the presentation. Dr. Chan Lan Chung is Associate Professor in Civil Engineering and a Senior Research Program Manager at the Natural Resources Research Institute, the University of Minnesota Duluth. She's an environmental engineer and studies uh, impacts of human activities on the natural water system. She and her um, students in her lab aim to understand chemical and microbial contaminants in natural uh, systems such as uh, lake streams and estuaries, as well as engineered systems such as sewers, treatment facilities, and stormwaters, stormwater systems. Uh, and they work on developing improved treatment technologies and mitigation strategies. The project that they're gonna tell you more about is first we must consider Manuman, tribally directed collaborative research uh, on wild rice. And before I turn it over, one last point, I'm happy to, to tell you all if you didn't know already that um, Crystal and Chan Lin, as well as a, a, a um, some of the other collaborators on this project are all WRS faculty members. So uh, over to you, Crystal. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation for me to speak with you today. So, um, and also I really appreciate that you started out with the land acknowledgement. And I think as you'll see, that's definitely very relevant for what I'll be talking about today. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about a tribally directed collaborative project called First We Must Consider Monomen, which is wild rice in the Ojibwe language. So I co-lead this project with Mike Dockery, who some of you might know. Uh, he's in the Forest Resources and American Indian Studies departments. And this is definitely a collaboration that involves many, many people, including a number of water resource science faculty members other than myself, as Jeff mentioned. Um, this actually includes two of our external partners, Chan Lan Chun, who you heard about, as well as Ed Swain. Um, and both of them are actually in the Zoom room today. So uh, we decided that maybe it would be less confusing if just I gave the main presentation, but they will be very happy to also take any questions at the end here. Okay, so I realized that the first we con must consider Monoman project is probably pretty different than what most standard research projects look like. So after first providing some background on Monoman, I'd like to actually explain how I, as a conventionally trained hydrologist, actually arrived at doing this kind of research. Now, as I mentioned, this kind of research involves many people beyond myself. So then I'll describe how this collaboration grew. Then I'll talk about some research we've been doing with one particular partner tribe and then I'll end with some thoughts on our ongoing work. Okay, so first though, I'll start off with talking about the significance of monomen or wild rice. 
So you've, if you've eaten wild rice, it was actually probably cultivated in patties in California because that's what's mostly sold in a lot of stores. But the real wild rice grows naturally in shallow lakes and streams in the upper Great Lakes region, like what you see here in this photo. And as you can see in this other picture, natural and cultivated wild rice are really different. Natural wild rice is much more varied in coloring and the texture and the taste, they're really quite distinct. Now you can buy natural wild rice in many stores in the upper Great Lakes region. And this includes at all the co-ops around the Twin Cities for those of you who are local around here. And I encourage you to look for it. So as I'm sure many of you know, wild rice is really special to us in the upper Great Lakes region. Um, it's the beloved state grain of Minnesota and for many Native Americans in the region, and that includes Ojibwe and the Dakota people. Natural wild rice is a profoundly important dietary, medicinal, cultural, and spiritual resource. In fact, the Ojibwe migration story revolves around wild rice. The Ojibwe people came to this part of North America from the Northeast five centuries ago, seeking their prophecied land where food grows on water. And that food is monomen, or wild rice in Ojibwe. So that means that they are here where they are today because of wild rice. And today, many Native people in the Upper Great Lakes region, including not just the Ojibwe, but also the Dakota people, continue to harvest and process wild rice using traditional methods. And wild rice plays an important role in their ceremonies. So you might be wondering why I, as a hydrologist, am, am talking about food in Native American tribes. Well, that's what I'd like to explain next, because a major goal of my talk is to have you understand why collaborative research with tribes can be so important for scientists like us. So wild rice captured my attention when I first arrived to Minnesota almost seven years ago. At the time, there was a heated debate going on in the news that I'm sure many of you remember about the state's very unique water quality standard of 10 parts per million of sulfate in wild rice lakes and streams. This was set to protect wild rice growth based on the observation that wild rice just doesn't seem to grow in waters that naturally have higher than this amount of sulfate. Now the controversy comes in though, because iron mining in the Northeastern part of the state releases highly elevated levels of sulfate into high wild rice watersheds. So this became really an all too common environmental battle of mining industries being pitted against Native American tribes. And what might not be also surprising given the unequal power dynamics between these two groups, no industry has ever been held to the sulfate standard ever since it went into place in the 1970s. But when I arrived in Minnesota about seven years ago, the EPA was actually beginning to apply pressure on the state to follow its own water quality standard. Now, of course, mining companies pushed back, claiming that there was a lack of scientific evidence that sulfate, in fact, impacts wild rice. And what followed was state-funded research that showed that in organic-rich wetland soils, sulfate can geochemically reduce to sulfide. And when there's not a lot of iron to precipitate out that sulfide, poor water sulfide can reach levels that can be toxic for wild rice. So Ed Swain, who's here in the room with us today, um, the Zoom room, I guess, uh, he was the lead state agency scientist doing this work, and he was a major co-author in the resulting paper by Mirabeau et al. And, and another group of papers. And so you should definitely ask him questions about this if you'd like to learn more at the end. He's now retired from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. So it seemed like it was perhaps a closed case, right? But industries continued to push back, and they pointed out that certain sites uh, seemed to buck the trend because they had both high sulfate concentrations and healthy wild rice stands. And that's where I came in. At the time, I met Ed, and he introduced me to the problem. He pointed out that until then, there hadn't been any hydrologists working on the problem. And I could see what he was looking at. Um, I, too, noticed that all this research was really, really focused in on the root zone biogeochemistry. And I began to wonder how the amount of sulfide produced from sulfate inputs could also be affected by fluxes between groundwater and surface water in the hyperreic zone, as well as interactions with a more complex chain of biogeochemical reactions. So I set out tackling the problem with my favorite tools, hydrological and reactive transport modeling. I also paired up with a geomicrobiologist, Kara Centelli, as well as an environmental engineer, Nate Johnson, who is also a WRS faculty member. And working together, we incorporated diverse hydrological, geochemical, microbial field data into my models. And we came up with a new conceptual model of hydrologically driven iron sulfur carbon cycling that involves cryptic reactions through intermediate valence sulfur forms. And so I think at this point, 
this is probably finally looking like the kind of project you might expect to find in an earth sciences or environmental engineering department. That's where Kara, Nate, and I come from. But here's the thing. This story is not the one that I want to focus on today. Instead, what I want to start with is the point at which it was starting to really bother me that a couple of major pieces were missing from this picture. First off, what happened to the wild rice, right? You might have noticed that I hardly mentioned it at, at all, as I got really carried away with all that exciting hydrogeology and biogeochemistry research. And secondly, what about people? So my original motivation for doing this work, right, was the fact that tribes are having their sacred wild rice threatened by industrial activities. Yet people, people never came in to my research picture at all. Now, in case you've forgotten after hearing about all that hydrology and biogeochemistry, I'll remind you that Native people have a profoundly deep connection with wild rice. Tribes have for generations been, and they continue to be harvesters and stewards of wild rice. Harvesting and eating wild rice, as many of you know, have also become family traditions for many non-Native people in the region. But for tribes, their connection with wild rice is more than only cultural. It's also a legal one. It's essential that you know that tribes' access to wild rice is legally protected by treaties signed by the U.S. government in the 1800s. And that includes in ceded territory outside their reservation boundaries. So humans and wild rice should definitely be a major part of the picture, right? But here's the issue. I'm actually a pretty introverted earth scientist and I've felt always motivated by societally relevant questions but I've always preferred to just stick with the hydrologic modeling, reactive transport modeling, and statistical modeling, because that's honestly what just feels a lot more comfortable for me. But as I began to learn more about tribes and wild rice, I found that I simply could not with a clean conscience keep just ignoring the human side of the issue. And here's why. Land colonization by Euro-Americans occurred in Minnesota in the 1800s. And in 1851, the state appropriated Dakota lands to establish the University of Minnesota. Fast forward about a century and University of Minnesota agronomists cultivated wild rice and patties. This is what probably a lot of you have eaten before. And university agronomists, they did this without tribal consent. This was considered by many native people to be deeply culturally offensive. Now to tribes, wild rice is sacred. To them, it's a relative like a grandmother. That's how some native people have explained it to me. And further, tribes are sovereign nations. Their right to wild rice is a legal treaty right. And they're concerned about the risks of genetic drift from cultivated rice to natural rice. And you know, tribes made their objections to wild rice cultivation perfectly clear. In a letter to the university in 1998, they wrote, we object to the exploitation of our wild rice for pecuniary or economic gain. And again, in 2003, the tribes demanded a moratorium on genomic research and genetic research of wild rice. Okay, so I moved to Minnesota in 2014, and in 2015, I began research on wild rice waters. And you know what? I have to confess, I did it without any tribal input. And meanwhile, as I felt like I was focusing on the you know, real science, the university took state funds to reinvigorate their cultivated wild rice research program and this fuels tensions with the tribes. Now, given this fraught history with tribes, I realized I had to change the way I was doing things. And that's where the collaboration journey begins. So about four years ago, I pulled together an interdisciplinary team from across the university to study both the physical and human dimensions of wild rice, all under the recognition of the profound cultural importance of wild rice to tribes. This time I included not just my usual collaborators from the geosciences, but also finally a plant ecologist and social scientists from different backgrounds. And we were really fortunate to receive a generous seed grant in 2018 for this work from the university. But I began to realize that there was still something wrong with our approach. Yes, I now had the people who think about the people who care about wild rice, but we were still missing those people who actually care about wild rice. And that's why this is where we are today. This is the full list of our project team. And in red are the name of tribal members or tribal representatives. And they include tribal resource managers, tribal harvesters, native researchers, and native students. And the project was given this Ojibwe name, Kwegda Nanagadawindang Monomen, which means first we must consider Monomen or wild rice to help remind everyone on the project of its guiding principles that we are working to protect a being that is sacred to tribes. Okay, so how did we get here? How did we get to 
this tremendous list of collaborators, well, I can tell you that it did not happen overnight. It took a lot of learning and a lot of hard work. So remember this timeline? Here we were starting our project at the pinnacle of tensions between the university and tribes over wild rice. But I have to confess something else. When I started this next phase of wild rice research, I still didn't really have a full grasp of the history. Sure, I knew that tribes have had unfortunate interactions with the university, but you know what? At this point, I had still never directly heard a native person talk about how it felt to them to have their sacred wild rice desecrated. I didn't know that tribal people get written into grant proposals to fulfill outreach requirements without ever being asked. I didn't know that researchers trespass on reservations to collect samples. I didn't know that Minnesota geologists have mapped mineral resources on reservation lands and this resulted in the displacement of tribes from their homelands. But I should have known. And when tribes realized that some of us, like me, hadn't put in the full effort to understand our own history and see what we had to do differently, they firmly made clear that we needed to do so first if we truly wanted to work together. And so now I do know to acknowledge the 11 federally recognized tribes in Minnesota, including four Dakota tribes in the north and seven Ojibwe or Anishinaabe tribes in the, north, in the north, uh, south and north. Those of us on the Twin Cities campus are in Dakota land, and those on the Duluth campus, I know some of you are here as well, are in Ojibwe land. And importantly, all of us associated with the University of Minnesota, regardless of where you might be calling in from today, we are benefiting from land appropriated from these tribes. In case you didn't know, University of Minnesota is a land grant university established using set investments made on tribal lands through the Morrill Act of 1862. This map shows the different tribal lands in blue that were granted by the federal government to fund University of Minnesota with the location of the Twin Cities campus shown in orange here. And as you can see, Tribal lands appropriated for establishing our university extends well beyond the physical footprint of our campuses. Most of this land was ceded by Dakota tribes and some to the north by Ojibwe tribes and almost always under coercion. Now, some payments were made to tribes for this land, but as you can see, there has been a staggering return of $251 for every $1 the US paid to tribes for the land granted to our university. So I'll let you determine whether you think a fair price was paid to tribes for their land. Now I'm still continuing to learn about this history and I really encourage you to learn more about the indigenous peoples where you have lived as well as the history your community has had with indigenous people. I've collected a number of resources over time as I'm learning and I'm really happy to share these with you if you're interested. Just contact me later for these. Okay, so returning to our wild rice project though. The tribes were absolutely right to call us out that we were on the path of repeating many of the same wrongs that so many researchers had done before us. Sorry, my cat's on my lap here. And so I decided that we had to do something that I knew was risky for our research careers. We put aside our original research plan for which we had sought some but insufficient input from tribes. And instead we spent the entire first half of the first year just traveling, traveling around Minnesota and Wisconsin to visit different tribes and tribal organizations. We realized that in our project, we had to prioritize tribal sovereignty and tribal perspectives. And so during these visits, we simply listened without any agenda. We listened to tribal concerns and insights on wild rice, and we listened to their concerns about working with university researchers. We also began to hold biannual conferences at tribal venues where participants from over a dozen tribes and tribal organizations across Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and even Ontario have come together to share their perspectives. And they explained to us something that they repeatedly tried what? to do. All right, to Minnesota. They explained something to us that they repeatedly try to get across to Minnesota state environmental agencies and that is, yes, mining derived sulfate is an extraordinarily important concern in Northeast Minnesota, but it's just one of many environmental stressors threatening wild rice throughout the Upper Great Lakes region, including all of the locations that are unaffected by mining. These threats include water level perturbations, climate change, invasive and competitive species, and other types of contaminants. Together, these stressors have led to the near decimation of wild rice in Michigan, a decline of a third of stands in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and decreases as well throughout Canada. And the unresolved problem is that in any particular location, 
the exact causes of wild rice impairment are often elusive. So even though I started out this project planning to pursue my own research interests on sulfate in Northeast Minnesota, our tribal partners helped us identify a far more comprehensive set of wild rice sites of interest that better represent the full range of environmental conditions experienced by wild rice. And importantly, at all these sites, including on-reservation sites and ceded territory sites, we spend time together with our tribal partners so that we can discuss ideas and collect new observations to figure out what's going on. So some of these field work trips have been combined with knowledge exchange workshops, such as at the Lac de Flambeau Reservation a couple years ago. At this workshop, we demonstrated our water and sediment sampling methods with tribal resource managers. Meanwhile, tribal community members recounted their experiences with wild rice with us. And they taught us about some of the cultural aspects of wild rice, including how to carve harvesting sticks and how to make birch bark baskets used to process the rice. Now a turning point really came when we started to recruit native and non-native students for the project. They became a common rallying point for us and the tribes as we shared the common desire to prepare the next generation to be even better scientists and stewards of the environment. And this group of students has been showing all of us what it looks like to reach across different experiences and backgrounds to work together. And as we spent more time with our tribal partners, some of them began to share with us a bit about how they think about Monoman or wild rice. Now, even though we're collaborating, we knew not to simply expect that this would happen because you know what? Tribes have experienced a long history of appropriation, right? They've had their land appropriated, their culture appropriated. They're not about to have their knowledge appropriated by us researchers as well. But as we began to build a foundation of trust, some tribal partners explained that they always think about Monoman in relationship with all the non-human and human elements around it. Native scholars have described indigenous knowledge as being holistic, integrative, and relational. And in contrast, in Western science, science, what we study, we like to break everything up in individual pieces and disciplines, right? And then only after the fact, we attempt to put them all back together again as we try to do interdisciplinary work. Now in our project, our tribal partners could see that we weren't all getting all the pieces together on our own. And it's been a great honor and a sign of trust for them to ask that we include some of their indigenous knowledge in our work so that we can together gain a more complete understanding of the full natural and human systems around wild rice. So focusing in a bit though on the biophysical side of the system, with our tribal partners, we have now come up with a conceptual model in which monomen, our wild rice, depends on the careful balance of multiple environmental factors. And we believe that this is why it's often so hard to determine why wild rice is impaired in a particular lake or stream. It's because sometimes it can be impossible to isolate one single factor. Now, proper management can help maintain this balance or else other human actions can perturb it, causing the niche where wild rice can grow to contract and allowing other plant species to take over. So we're starting to intensively examine these multiple factors at four wild rice sites of concern to our tribal partners. And this work is ongoing, but I wanna give you an idea of what we've begun to find together with our partners from the Lac de Flambeau Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. So the Lac de Flambeau Reservation is located in Northern Wisconsin and the research that we've done there is part of my student, Alex Swahid's recent master's thesis. He just graduated last month. Now our Lac de Flambeau tribal partners are Joe Gravine and Eric Chapman, both are tribal resource managers and tribal council members. My colleagues, Kara Santelli and Dan Larkin have also been part of this work, as well as a number of other grad students, Maddie Nyblade, Josh Torgerson, and Patrick O'Hara. Okay, so with Lac de Flambeau, we're working at a wild rice river on their reservation. But Lac de Flambeau has requested that we do not disclose the name or exact location of this river in order to protect culturally sensitive information. So I'll just be referring to it as the Lac de Flambeau River site. So the Lac de Flambeau River site has one reach with abundant wild rice, while just about maybe five kilometers upstream, there's a reach that once had similarly abundant wild rice, but for unknown reasons, it now has only sparse rice growing in it, along with some other perennial aquatic plant types that you see here. Now, because this pair of subsites otherwise experience similar climate and plant genetic base, they present an ideal test case for identifying causes of wild rice impairment. Now, because of our tribal partners' close familiarity with the site, 
it made a lot of sense to build our research off of their previous knowledge and hypotheses. So specifically, our tribal partners at Lac de Flambeau had ideas about the potential impact of sediment characteristics, road salting, and nearby dam and bridge constructions on the subsite that now has sparse wild rice. And based on their ideas, as well as the methods we can offer, we decided together to evaluate the vegetation, hydrology, water chemistry, and sediment conditions at both subsites. We also decided to try to put the trends we observed at the Lac de Flambeau River site into a regional context. And all the while, we sought to integrate tribal knowledge with our Western science approach. Now to present what we're finding so far, I'm gonna work my way around this jointly developed conceptual model. Can you turn the sound down? Okay, so to present what we're finding so far, I'll work, um, I just want to mention that uh, tribes know that hydrology is important for wild rice because it is the food that grows on water. And even though suitable water depth ranges for wild rice growth have been previously noted in the literature, a lot less is known about the influence of temporally variable water levels or groundwater exchange. And so this is what we decided to focus on. Now we're still waiting to collect longer term records, but here are time series for groundwater and surface water ahead at the two subsites over one of the two growing seasons we've been able to track thus far. Now we're finding at, uh, at the dense rice subsite, water levels actually tend to start off lower in the early season. And the difference between the groundwater and surface water head indicate upwelling of groundwater. And in contrast, at the sparse rice subsite, water levels actually start out a bit higher and there seems to be a slight downwelling of surface water. And we're now evaluating whether the low water levels in the early season could be benefiting fragile seedlings and whether upwelling of groundwater is providing greater inputs of nutrients for the wild rice. Now, I also wanna mention that one of our tribal partners was explaining to me that we have a word for the part of the stream bed where water from above meets water from below. Now this absolutely intrigued me. So those of you hydrologists out there, we know that we call this the hyperreic zone and it's become quite trendy lately to study it. But the Ojibwe have long had a word in their everyday vocabulary for thinking about this. Now for the water chemistry, so much recent attention has been paid to mining derived sulfate in Northeast Minnesota. There's also been mesocosm exper uh, experiments showing nitrogen and phosphorus limitation effects in wild rice. Now at the Lac de Flambeau River site, which is far from any mining activities, we wanted to take a comprehensive look at the water chemistry, including an assessment of nutrients within a field setting. Now we looked at nine different analytes, but with the interest of time, I'll first just quickly mention that road salting did not appear to be a problem based on the chloride data. And then I'll just focus on, in on some differences that did seem to appear in the nutrients between the two subsites. Now in these plots, the blue shows the surface water chemistry and the tan here shows the shallow and the deeper poor water chemistry in the stream bed. And when you compare the green and red bars here for the abundant and sparse sites, you can see that nitrate plus nitrate and phosphate concentrations are somewhat higher in the abundant rice subsite compared to the sparse subsite. Now these measurements possibly could be adding field evidence for previously noted nitrogen and phosphorus nutrient limitations from mesocosm experiments. We're still looking into this. Now what was really interesting is that poor water calcium was also somewhat higher in the abundant rice subsite, um, more at depth in the poor water. And it's, important, and it's important has never really been noted before in the previous literature on wild rice. And so this has us asking whether wild rice may be particularly sensitive to calcium availability. We've also had a number of tribal partners urging us to examine the sediment. And it turns out that at the Lac de Flambeau site, probably the most glaring differences that we've observed between the two subsites have all been in the sediment. We found that at the site with the sparse uh, rice, there was a staggering five meters of really loose muck in the lake, in the uh, riverbed. And this deep muck consists of much higher organic content con um, compared to the dense site. And so this has us asking whether the really mucky and high organic content conditions could be impairing seed germination at this sparse site. Now I have to say, I initially didn't think we would do much work with the sediments, and that's because there's relatively less mention of sediments being a major cause for impairment for wild rice growth in the recent academic literature. And so I really wondered why it was then that so many tribal partners kept asking us again and again about the sediments. So one tribal partner explained it to me this way. 
Of course we think about the sentiments, she said. It's what Muskrat picked up and put on Turtle's back in our origin story. So as you can see, it was a different worldview and it was a fresh idea of what to look at in our research. Now Lactus Lambo is just one site where we're working. And so we knew that it's important for all of our tribal partners that we put local observations with individual partners into a wider regional context. And so to do this, we leveraged a previously existing data set with 116 wild rice lakes and streams in Minnesota. The data set was originally used in the state funded study that I previously talked about, which demonstrated sulfate and sulfide impacts on wild rice. So my student Alex implemented a statistical reanalysis of the data set, which used a method that differed from the previous analysis in a number of ways that were responsive to what tribes believed to be important for wild rice. So first off, we made sure to consider complex interactions of multiple variables beyond sulfate and sulfide. Further, while previous analysis only looked at wild rice presence and absence, we considered wild rice abundance, which not only teases out more gradual influences, but this also recognizes the concern that tribes have had have of any level of impaired wild rice growth. So out of the 26 variables we considered, our reanalysis identified five statistically significant predictors of wild rice abundance. Two of these five variables were sediment total organic carbon, or TOC, and poor water calcium. It was very interesting to see these two emerge as significant predictors because they actually seem to be corroborating some of the differences we observed at the two subsites at Lac de Flambeau. So here's a reminder of what we found there, at this, uh, at, and specifically at the subsite that had abundant rice compared to the subsite that had sparse rice. And as you can see, like in our Lac de Flambeau field data, our regional statistical reanalysis also showed that higher poor water calcium and lower sediment total organic carbon may correspond with greater rice abundance. Okay, so I should note that the regional data set did not include complete hydrological measurements, and so it wasn't possible to look for a correspondence with the hydrological observations that we had at Lactic Lambeau. But for the sediment total organic carbon and the poor water calcium, these could be important new findings about wild rice sensitivity. Neither high sediment total organic carbon nor poor water calcium, low poor water calcium have been widely considered to be major factors impairing wild rice health when you look in the recent uh, literature. And again, I want to emphasize it was our tribal partners knowledge and questions that led us to these findings. So our research with tribal partners really has just begun. Um, in looking at the Lacta Flambeau River site, of course, the question is what kind of disturbance happened in the surrounding watershed that could have triggered changes in the hydrology, sediment conditions, and water chemistry, which has clearly altered the plant ecology at the sparse rice subsite over the last 50 years. Here, our tribal partners again have a lot of ideas about disturbances. They're asking about the potential effects of logging and about potential impacts of the dam and bridge that are constructed right near the sparse river spice sparse rice site, and they have a lot of questions about climate change effects. Now, as our seed grant ended, we've been really fortunate to have just received new funding, including from the USGS, to understand climate change impacts on wild rice. And our collaborative USGS proposal really demonstrates that tribes aren't just waiting around for us university researchers to help them. Tribal natural resource departments already have their own rigorous research programs. For our climate change proposals, a proposal tribal partners had already conducted climate change impact assessments using physically downscale climate projections and they found that wild rice is highly vulnerable and their work provided us with a strong launching point for our collaborative work in which we'll, we will be researching how climate change will not only directly affect wild rice but also how it will affect upland vegetation which controls how much runoff and base flow reaches wild rice lakes and streams. Now, as a hydrologic modeler, I'm especially excited about our plans to do tribal community engaged uh, earth system and watershed modeling as part of this climate change research. This type of integrated modeling is notoriously challenging, and I believe that tribal community knowledge can help constrain the uncertainties and how the different components connect within the model. Now, I'm also very much aware that although I introduced our project as an interdisciplinary one that also includes social sciences, I've only showed you biophysical science results so far. And of course, we do also have an awesome social dimensions team uh, for the PIs. This includes Mike Dockery, with whom I co-lead this project, as I mentioned before, and Mae Davenport, 
We also have the grad student, Hannah Jo King, researcher Emily Green, and former postdoc Laura Madsen. And they've pursued a number of research directions. With guidance from various tribal partners, they've conducted a survey of non-tribal state harvesters, and they showed that uh, they also highly value stewardship and research activities that support wild rights preservation. The Social Dimensions team also carried out a study on tribal state consultation around Minnesota's sulfate standard. They aim to understand obstacles to having tribal perspectives and tribal sovereignty honored in environmental policy making at the state level. Now, although our biophysical and social science sub teams have regular project meetings together and we coordinate all our field visit visits, uh, we do admittedly have um, done a lot of, I'd say, parallel play when it comes to our actual research. Now, to fully pull the pieces together now, we also just got new funding from NSF CNH2 program, or the Dynamics of Integrated Socio-Environmental Systems, so that we can continue to do the work on combining our different knowledges among different research disciplines within Western science and with indigenous knowledge from our tribal partners. Now, although many of our, of our Many of our project's findings are yet to come under these new grants. I can say that our major result thus far, and I'm certain this will be one of our most important contributions, is that working on wild rice has taught us how to do research in a way that is much more culturally and ethically responsible, collaborative, and interdisciplinary. And fundamentally, what this took was first taking the time to build respectful and accountable relationships. And our group published our first manuscript which describes this crucial partnership building step. It had 37 co-authors in all, including tribal and university project members. And in the appendix of our paper, we've included a copy of our written protocol on responsible and ethical research with tribes on wild rice. Every new team member is required to read it when they join, and the protocol serves as a starting point for memorandum of understanding that we have signed with individual tribal partners that we work with. Now, I want to emphasize that it's of course the practice of responsible research that is more important than a written document, but this written document helps to ensure that all researchers are held accountable for conducting respectful research with tribes, tribal lands and water, and wild rice. Okay, so returning to our timeline, we submitted our paper for journal review in mid-May last year. And that was, and just 10 days later after that, George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis actually not too far from where I live. Another unarmed black man was murdered by a police officer. And of course, we're all trying to figure out how to do our part to fight the injustices and inequities that permeate our communities. And how to do this is a really, really big question. And what I've realized over the last few years on the Wild Rice Project is that as environmental scientists, we are in a position to be thinking about and working toward environmental justice. And environmental justice goes hand in hand with social justice. This is clearly the case for indigenous environmental justice because many indigenous people view humans and the environment as being inextricably linked. Now, I wanna make sure to point out this quote that says that this perspective is not poetic, but it's practical. It's always important to emphasize that indigenous ideas are not something to be romanticized, but they should be taken seriously as simply their worldview. And it's why Dakota scholar Waziyatawan says, from the perspective of our worldview, the devastation to our homeland is a mere reflection of what has happened to our people, because the fate of our people is intertwined with the fate of our homeland. So finally, I want to end by saying that not only does working with community members on environmental justice problems ensure that research benefits society, but also including their diverse perspective makes, their, makes our science so much better. Now I can attest that with this project, recognizing tribal sovereignty, prioritizing tribal perspectives and including diverse students has transformed my understanding of the environment. But for those of you who want rigorous data analysis to believe that diversity makes our science so much better, I can point you to this recent PNAS paper. They found that demographically underrepresented students innovate at higher rates than majority students. But it's not enough just to get them into the doors of our educational institutes, because even though they are more innovative, the study finds that their novel contributions are discounted. Now, what a loss, right? Not only for them, but for our entire scientific community, which has so much to gain from innovations of diverse, diverse students, and I'll add from the innovations of external community partners. And so here are just some 
some closing thoughts from our project. Maybe before this, you only ever thought of wild rice as a specialty food, but I hope you now see that monomen or natural wild rice holds deep cultural importance to native people and it's legally protected by treaties signed by the US government. And I hope I've shown that the settler colonial past and present call for new research protocols that upholds tribal sovereignty, ethical practices and relationship building. In our work on Monoman, we've learned that collaboration requires university researchers to listen, have humility and spend time together with tribal partners and communities. Also, studying monomen is revealing the complex inter uh, interactions involving biophysical and social dimensions. And finally, we have found that collaboration with tribal partners makes our work more just and it makes our science better. I also want to point out that while our work is having important impacts locally in the Upper Great Lakes region, it also has far reaching lessons. Based on what we're learning here, it's clear that Monoman serves as a flagship for supporting indigenous resource sovereignty, whole earth system science and environmental sustainability around the world. Now, I'll just end by reiterating that this work is a large collaborative effort, collaborative effort with a number of WRS faculty involved. In addition to myself, May Davenport and Dan Larkin are other WRS members who are principal investigators on the project. I already mentioned uh, Chan Lan Chun and Ed Swain, who are external partners and also on uh, today's Zoom call. And other WRS faculty are also approaching wild rice research in a holistic and collaborative way with tribes. And these include Nate Johnson at UMD, with whom I've had a chance to work with. And I definitely want to end by mentioning John Pastor at UMD, who retired a couple years ago. John Pastor was probably one of the first University of Minnesota faculty members to forge a good working relationship with tribes on wild rice research. And so as we move to questions, I again want to remind everyone that Chan Lan and Ed are also in the Zoom room. This is always odd to do uh, in this virtual world here. And um, they're here to field questions about their work that they do on wild rice that intersects with our first We Must Consider Monoman project. And so um, here's a little bit more background information about them. Jeff already introduced Chan Lan here. Um, she and I definitely look forward for the pandemic to end so that we can continue to do collaborative field work together. And I really encourage you to ask her more about what she's finding with microbes in the sediments around wild rice. And Ed um, is an adjunct professor in at WRS and he's a retired state agency scientist. And I definitely have Ed to thank for first introducing me to this incredibly important research area around wild rice. And any questions about state agency science should definitely go to him. And with that, I really thank you all for your attention. Um, we're here to take questions, but I'll also point you to our website here uh, for the project, Monoman Singh. So Monoman, of course, is wild rice in Ojibwe. Singh is the Dakota word for wild rice. You can find a lot more information there as well. So I will stop sharing my screen so I can more easily see you all. And um, we are happy to take questions. Thank you so much, uh, Crystal. As you can see, you're getting a virtual round of applause here. Uh, that was a really interesting presentation, not only on the science, but of course about the collaboration and addressing these uh, long standing and challenging issues with our tribal partners. Um, for those of you who have questions, I put a note in this about the, uh, in, in the chat box, but you can type your questions into the chat box if you would like, and we'll, we'll read them to the panelists and they can, I guess, decide among themselves who wants to take each, each question. Um, you can also raise your um, virtual hand. You'll find the raise hand function in, uh, by clicking on the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, or if those, the way you're connected doesn't make either of those options practical for you, you can just unmute when we're between questions and address your question that way. So, oh, and my apologies for not introducing Ed Swain and thank you for, for uh, doing that, uh, Crystal. Our first question is, is in the chat box already, so I'll read it to you. Uh, you talked about how your project shifted early on to create space for listening to and learning from tribal leaders before conducting the main research. 
was there any hesitancy from the leaders that scholars only listen, but end up ignoring them anyway? In other words, were any relationships so broken from previous appropriative research that leaders did not trust that this time would be different and thus did not want to work with you? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question because I definitely was concerned about that as well. Um, I'll also say that we started out talking with tribal resource managers because it was definitely more appropriate to have you know, our level as a scientist to be talking with tribal resource managers. And only then after that, did they facilitate in conversations with tribal leaders since um, kind of the leadership to leadership connection would have been more appropriate for those kinds of conversations. But still getting to the um, meat of your question here, we were definitely concerned about that. And I actually have to say that I've been astounded in this project by how willing so many different tribes were to, um, to working with us once we did start to listen. And I often actually say that, like, you know, I think we get this question of like, how, how was it that we ended up being able to work with tribes after, you know, there have been such damaging relationships. And I often say, well, I think we were just decent people. And, you know, just the fact that we listened, you know, they were really, really so not all tribes, right? So we work with some tribes. Um, so it's definitely a, a situation by situation basis, but a lot of them were willing to engage with us as long as we just kind of indicated that we were willing to listen and we were willing to continue to check in with them. We were willing to um, you know, find out whether or not they had um, feedback on what we were doing and that we would continue working together um, kind of collaboratively. I don't know that I would have predicted that. In fact, it was really scary in the beginning of this project because I thought maybe we just got a grant and we made a commitment that we wouldn't move forward unless they said that we should. And I thought maybe we wouldn't have a project and we weren't, we didn't know what we would do with this grant, how we were gonna report back to our, the funders. Um, but yeah, I think just by being decent people and just with the simple act of listening, it was really incredible what kinds of partnerships we could build. So thanks for that question. Uh, I, I just put in uh, in the chat box the link to the project website, which uh, Crystal mentioned on her slides, but you can just click on that and go there uh, if you want to look around. I think there's quite a lot of resources as she mentioned there. So next question we got via chat is, are there any specific scientific methods that may be inappropriate to conduct in the lands of indigenous people? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Anna, for that question. I also just want to say um, Chan Lan does uh, very much collaborate with tribes as well. So I I don't know which page you are on my Zoom here, but I think you're here, Chan Lan. So please feel free to chime in as well and add as well with any of these questions. But um, I can take my first stab at this. So again, I do want to emphasize each tribe is their own sovereign nation, and they do have um, just different views on different issues. And so what might be appropriate or inappropriate for one tribe might be, um, yeah, might be different for another tribe. And so uh, we definitely hear that. And I think our general policy is that if there could be differences in opinion, we just step back and we'd rather not engage in any kind of research where there's even one of our tribal partners who would view that as being inappropriate. So, um, you know, I think that there are definitely some tribes that have concerns about experimentation. So actually, um, we've really not done any direct work with wild rice. While, you know, th there are definitely other tribes, though, that set up mesocosm experiments. And so they, they do believe that, you know, these limited experiments um, for the greater good of Monoman is certainly appropriate. Um, but that, that's sort of one example there. Um, maybe some other protocols that we have certainly incorporated into our practices is, um, so some of our tribal partners have actually asked us to offer tobacco before we do any um, field work, before, certainly before we take any samples. Now, I want to say that we're always very careful about being appropriative, and so um, as a general 
as a general kind of practice myself, um, I don't do this unless we are out with a tribal partner who asks us to do so. Um, sometimes we're out with native students and not our tribal partners and they've wanted to lead us in offering tobacco and we do so. But um, we definitely, we discuss this with each tribal partner and some tribal partners um, really haven't asked us to do it. And I interpret that as they would find that appropriative if I did it without them being there. While others have asked that even if they're not there that we should do so. And so we do that. Um, so those are just some examples that I can, uh, I can point to, but maybe even more generically, I would say that we actually always review our, um, our research plan with our tribal partners before going out. So um, we don't take for, we, we don't assume that, you know, certain methods are always going to be okay. We always want to know in advance, is this particular method okay to do in this particular place? And so sometimes we're asked not to be out um, during more sensitive times for the nomen because that, you know, we shouldn't be damaging any of the stocks. Um, let's see, some other requests that we've had. Um, some of our tribal partners actually prefer that there's um, an elder there who, who gives some sort of prayer before we go out. Um, and um, yeah, I think those are some of the considerations that our group has had. Okay, I, so this is a challenge. Thank you, Crystal, it's great to talk. And then maybe I can chime in a little bit for the um, you know, scientific method. So one of the projects we are, the UMD and IRI is working on is actually looking at the microbial community in the soil sediment system. And then, you know, it's kind of looking at the microbes as the another kind of ecological kind of component in the wild rice kind of wetland. And then our methodology using the DNA sequencing. And then when we work with the tribal member, tribal member actually specific asked you know, how do we use the DNA sequencing? So at, at that time, they really concerned about the, since we are kind of get the sediment and then extract the DNA, that DNA is has the like all mixture. It's not just microbes. You will have the fungi or they test the plant tissues or the other insect kind of uh, DNA. So they actually kind of concerned about the, we were sequencing about the wild rice itself. So kind of try to rebuild. So we kind of had the kind of conversation and then actually they gave us kind of guidance. You know, we are only looking at the, we are using the dead DNA, just kind of studying the microbial community. I think that is the kind of another kind of example. And then I think I added the one more example kind of Krista mentioned is the, the indigenous group and then tribal member really care about the natural kind of nature, kind of nature as the nature. That's kind of how I kind of understood. So they do not want a lot of disturbance by the, even though it's important for the science and they may kind of improve our understanding and they improve maybe the restoration activity, but they want to actually kind of preserve to that method. So they kind of ask us do not use the actual boat, motor boat. So try to kind of use the canoe and then maybe we can actually work with the actually Fond du Lac or the other tribe kind of natural resource team kind of sampling effort together. So those, I guess this is case by case and then they have the different opinion, but I think it's important to have the conversation and then we can kind of ask also, maybe answer is wrong, no, or, or we can kind of uh, listen what they are kind of uh, asking us to do. I think that that's very important. Thank you. Um, I'm finding where we left off in the chat box here. Next question is, uh, have there been any updates in response to the University of Minnesota uh, to the complaints of tribes on genetic research in wild rice? Yeah, you know, I think this is a really, really tough and um, delicate subject here. Um, so, you know, the university did accept funds to continue that kind of research. And so that does continue in 
our university. And um, I personally don't have a lot of uh, involvement in this particular situation, but I can actually say that just recently our tribal partners have been probing us and they've been saying, you know, it's really great that we now have these um, strong relationships with your group, with Chanlan's group, with, um, you know, Nate Johnson. And he's like, but it still seems like something's missing because that other research, that genetic research is still going on and we're left pretty much in the dark about it, you know. And, and I think even the way that this particular tribal partner described it was that, you know, it's not even, it's, it, he, he's not even saying that he, he is on the attack, but he's just really, really concerned that there's just no communication between what that group is doing and with tribes when it's about something that matters so much to them. And so I will say that just with this recently being brought up and him actually pushing us, he says, well, you're members of the university. Isn't there something that you can do just to raise awareness of leadership that we're still really concerned. We haven't forgotten about this issue. And so, um, you know, I think Mike Dockery, who co-leads this with me, he's um, in the American Indian Studies Department. And I think we kind of decided it was probably a little bit more appropriate for him to be kind of working in this arena to pursue some of these, um, the, these, this situation. And so um, I think we'll see, but, um, that's, you know, but but just currently right now that that research is going on. Jeff, did you want me to try to did did you want to facilitate or did you want me just to try to go through these in the chat box or also if you if you have them up and and want to just uh, take them that that that's totally fine. Okay. Um, yeah, so John, John Niebuhr is asking me about what that, um, what the Ojibwe word could be for hyperreic zone because I mentioned that they have a word, but I didn't say what it was. And it is true, I didn't say it. And um, I guess kind of again, going back to protocol, maybe the one thing I forgot to say when somebody asked about scientific methods is, um, you know, I think we're really moving towards, um, so John, I'm eventually gonna answer your question, but I think we're, you know, we're really being, uh, there's a big emphasis, right, for open data sharing. That's and for open for transparency. And I think overall that's a great, great policy. But I think what it overlooks is that for tribes, uh, having open having data be public can really be concerning because they've had data used against them before. And so, um, so actually, we've had to. In our, you know, grant proposal, for any of you've written like an NSF proposal, you know, you have to, or any proposal, you have to write a data management plan, right? So in our data management plan, we said, no, we're actually not going to follow your policy that says that all of our data has to be made public. If a tr our tribal partner says that any on reservation data should not be made public, then we're not going to do it. And if this is not okay for NSF or USGS, then we're actually just gonna abstain from doing those research activities. So John, the reason why this is related to your question is that, I mean, a lot of that um, kind of sensitivity is certainly around culturally important areas. And the issue of language has come up a lot before in terms of it really, um, really embodying a lot of meaning, uh, you know, language. And so I remember there was even discussion about maybe our, you know, summer interns can do some learning around like native names for things like that. And we were really, and, and they really were very hesitant about this. You know, I think they were like, well, we wouldn't know what gets, how, how that's going to be used, you know? And so um, this tribal partner in a conversation with me mentioned that they have this word. He didn't offer to tell me this word. And I've now understand I've now understood something like that is not something I should ask. If he wanted to tell it to me, he would have. Um, but otherwise, um, definitely anything that's culturally sensitive, I understand that this is just something that I don't personally ask about. So that was my very long-winded answer to your question, John, but came back and reminded me to kind of address again that question about kind of scientific protocols. Um, Jeff, should I continue? I see that it's 1034. I'm sorry if I went a little bit long. When I no, it's it's actually okay. We we have until uh, 11 if, if we oh, need okay. to use that much time. 
So we can, this is uh, some excellent discussion. So we, we can uh, keep going here. Uh, although I should say if you know folks have to leave, obviously they can uh, find their way to the next uh, Zoom room down the hall. They have to be in whatever. Um, are you, are, are you uh, in following the chat thread here? Or do you want me to read this next question? Um, well, yell at me if I've missed one, but I see David Mola, thanks for your question about uh, native perspectives on relationships between monoman fish, insects, and birds. And so, of course, I'm, I'm just sharing what I've heard and how I understand our tribal partners to understand things. And it's always, I feel like I'm in a delicate position to be talking about their perspectives for them. But at least what I understand from what they've shared is that, yes, there's very much a connection with fish, insects, and birds. and one thing I, again, I feel like I have a lot of confessions in my presentation is that I think I always prided myself on being that hydrologist who really thinks about integrated systems and how you know a lot of different things are connected. But I'll say in this project, I'm constantly being pushed about, you know, well, actually, what about the connection to this that I've never thought about before? And so we are definitely very conscious of the fact that, okay, we've now kind of on our team, we've got you know, plant ecolog ecologists, we've got the geochemist, and, you know, we've got a number of pieces covered, but one pretty gaping hole is definitely um, animals, wildlife, and yeah, so I, I can at least give a few examples of just what you have on here. Um, fish, so definitely there's an interaction with, um, th there have been invasive carp in some lakes that have actually wiped out wild rice. I mean, I think they, they wipe out, as, as I understand it, just about all the aquatic vegetation from the way that they feed. Um, and uh, there's actually one site that we work at um, with the St. Croix tri tribe um, in Wisconsin, where they actually have a lake where they have um, done a lot to trap the carp and they're actually restoring the lake and, and it's working. The wild rice is actually coming back. So there's definitely that interaction with birds. This is actually a newer um, problem that's emerging. Um, our partners at Fond du Lac and 1854 Treaty Authority in Northeast Minnesota tell us that um, there's been really an, a sharp increase in the population of swans. And swans in Greece definitely feed on the grains. And actually, they have been describing to me that it's not even just the herbivory that's a problem, but sometimes flocks come down and they just flatten a whole area. So they're actually just like physically breaking the stalks. Um, and I think they've been trying different ways to keep them away. I, I think one tribal partner from Fond du Lac described it as they put on pyrotechnic shows to just try to scare them away so that, you know, um, maybe that, that, that's kind of a relatively harmless way of taking care of it, but, but it's a major problem that, that's increasing that they used to not see in past years. Um, those are some negative impacts, but I also want to say that they definitely, our tribal partners, what I'm hearing is that they also often bring up positive relationships. Um, so um, at Big Rice Lake, which is um, a site where Chanlan and I have been collaborating, actually, I think Chanlan's done a lot more work than me there um, in terms of sampling. Um, I've heard from Fond du Lac partner say that, you know, he's noticed that there's a lot less muskrats there over the years. And, you know, muskrats, maybe the way they move, they actually, you know, can help kind of stir up the sediments a bit, like just not too much that it's such a problem, like with the invasive carp, but just enough maybe to help kind of bring the seeds kind of more to the surface that helps germination. And he was pretty convinced that it was something about, you know, you know, he said that muskrats should be there and there's other things going on that maybe is keeping them away. I've heard that mentioned before. Uh, beavers actually, so as a hydrologist, right? Like beavers are the ultimate hydrologist in controlling water levels. And this often is a major reason, like known reason when sometimes wild rice gets wiped out from a, from a lake because it's being dammed and the water levels are too high. But I think interestingly, even though like they're kind of a cause for, you know, wild rice going away in certain lakes, I've always heard our tribal partners kind of talk about it as, well, it's just kind of a, a relationship to be, um, I guess, negotiated or, or kind of um, facilitated with beavers. So yes, they'll take out dams, but there's never this sense of like, oh, well, those, you know, 
it's not in with animosity, I guess, is maybe the best way that I can say it. So there's definitely a lot of connections there that I don't understand the full extent of, but we're definitely constantly being reminded that we're still only looking at a small part of the picture. Thanks, David. Um, so the climate change question from Peyton. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is exactly what we're seeking to do. Um, so we, there have been probably at two of our sites, tribal resource managers suspect that um, a certain drought year could have played an effect in, um, in kind of a, a big knockback of the, of, of the stands. Um, and, but we don't really know for sure. And that's one of our um, grants moving forward. That's, that's one of the major aspects that we want to look at is how climate change has affected or will be affecting wild rice. And I think I mentioned that there have been a couple of major tribal uh, climate change assessment studies done already. Um, those assessments covered many, many different species or beings, which is how it, it, it's worded in some of the, in, in their reports. Um, and they, based on their evaluation of just knowing how these different species react to, um, to various climate variables, they did both determine that um, wild rice is vulnerable. One kind of, one found it medium vulnerable, one of them highly vulnerable. Um, but we're hoping to kind of look at that more closely. And the interesting thing when you look at this report is, again, it's, you know, they don't just stop at like, well, how will temperature affect it? Because temperature can. So wild rice seeds, um, they, they need a hard freeze in order to, for the seeds to germinate. So definitely warming winter temperatures will be an issue. Um, and definitely, you know, greater precipitation that's predicted in this region, if that causes higher water levels, especially in the spring, um, you know, that can be an issue. But when you look at the report, they also talk about other things such as like higher humidity, possibly leading to higher, you know, greater occurrences of, of fungus. And um, because wild rice can be affected by brown spot or, you know, are they gonna be affecting, you know, other types of wildlife that interact with monomen? Um, or is it going to be affecting upland vegetation, which, you know, affects monomen? And that's one connection that we're going to be looking at. So I would say we are hoping to look more into this kind of in the next phase of our work. Um, thank you, Patrick, for weighing in about the hyperreic zone and Dakota language for this. So he says some Dakota people he knows Patrick knows has taught him that words are embedded in stories and relationships. And knowing the word means needing to know all of the stories and relationships associated with it, some of which are not for us to know. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, for, for adding that. I think you have even a, a more complete understanding of why this is a, a, a sensitive issue. Well, I, I, it looks like I don't see any more questions in, in, in the chat. Maybe I can take a, my prerogative here and ask you one final one, which is either for you or, and or your um, collaborators to, to weigh in on. Would you have any advice for um, a researcher who is in a position like you were in, as you described a few years ago, where they, they may have some research either ongoing or planned that they feel, you know, moving forward, will, it'll be important and necessary to reach out to tribes about what they're doing uh, because the research is related in some way, but they don't have connections that they have never, um, you know, made those connections before. Do, do you have a recommendation about like what the first thing to do is, where to start? I know what I would do is I would come and talk to you, but uh, <laughs> uh, but beyond that, maybe. Yeah, and uh, thanks for that question, Jeff. Um, and I would probably, you know, one of the things I would do is, uh, you know, point you to our our paper, which has the protocol in it, which is it's specific to wild rice, but actually our partners have been. Um, our tribal partners 
we've heard have actually been pointing to researchers working on other things to look at the protocol because I think it really captures at least a lot of what we need to do in order to do respectful research. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that one thing is definitely start the communication really early. Um, you know, I think that was the misstep that we had is that, you know, I think we had a couple of phone calls and then we wrote the proposal and we're like, okay, it had, and you know, we even cited like community-based participatory research because we're like, we, we had to email, you know? Um, and, you know, we needed to have started that communication, you know, before two weeks before the proposal was due, which is why we only had two email exchanges because that was the timeline we operated on. And I mean, very fortunately, even going back to Catherine's question to me in the beginning, Luckily, you know, they were actually very understanding in the end, as long as we did eventually take the time, you know, and they're savvy too. They write research proposals. They get that there's deadlines, right? But like, don't then just plow on ahead. Like maybe as the research proposal have part one be partnership building. You know, I was actually, um, um, actually Minnesota DNR, some, some scientists from Minnesota DNR approached me because tribal partners appointed them to our group because they wanted to write an LCCMR proposal. And um, they're like, well, you know, we've already spent all this time telling the, the group at University of Minnesota how to do things. Maybe they can just tell you this time rather than us having to tell everything all over again. And, you know, and so I made the suggestion that I guess I wish that in our proposal, we were just more honest and just said, well, really the proposal is about partnership building. And so in the end, I mean, they did have some vague indication of like, you know, they're going to collect data and whatever, but they said part one, activity one was um, build partnerships and activity two was we'll collect the samples that we determined to be important through activity one. And it was the most vague LCCMR proposal I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, tribes ended up being a number of tribes, you know, ended up being on board with it and um, and it actually went through. In terms of like actually making the connections though, Jeff, one thing I've been hesitant about is making introductions between researchers who contact me or our group and the tribal partners we're working with because I don't want to start to be like just a conduit for people to get a connection with these tribal partners. And some of them um, I've definitely heard from like Great Lakes Fish and um, Glyphwood, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission um, scientists that say they get barraged with scientists who say, let's write a proposal, let's write a proposal. Um, and so I don't want it to then be like, well, people are going to see me as a way to get someone to respond to an email. That's not what I'm, I, I'm not trying to make their like email list even, their emails even busier. So, um, you know, I, I, I say that I can share like my, the lessons, the hard lessons that we've learned, but um, I think a lot of it is probably just sometimes it is looking up on a tribal, um, a, a tribe's website, looking for the, the commensurate like division there, you know, an environmental division, the water research, they're all gonna be organized separately, uh, slightly differently figure out who would be at the same level that you are. You don't contact, you know, tribal chairperson. <laughs> um, you know, you, you contact someone who you think is about at the same, at the right level that you should be contacting, and then you try it. And, um, you know, I think you can also, I, I think it's not easy. I, I have to say, I definitely, you know, I benefited from having um, collaborators who already had some connections. And so that was definitely, and, and then it grew, you know, like, and then um, through them, we met other tribal resource managers. And so, you know, in terms of what that first connection is, I mean, for us, we went to a conference that's held by jointly with university and tribes um, about wild rice. And so just in person, we got to meet some tribal resource managers. And then from there, it really, it's the beginning of a slow process of talking with people. Um, I mean, it's slow, it's however fast it needs to be for, you know, whoever's on the tribal side to feel comfortable with working with you. So that's kind of my long story. So again, sorry, you get a little bit long-winded, but I don't know if Chanlan, you have anything to add for that? question for your 
experience? You know, I want to echo to the, what Crystal said. I think uh, common, I mean, my case too, first time I work with the tribe member, you know, I have this idea, it's kind of great to, we can kind of study together. And then maybe I started the drafting the proposal and then kind of share, but I guess it's the starting conversation first before the proposal. I think building relationship is, uh, it need to be more like organic. It shouldn't be like the just kind of email out or like, here is the form, this is what we want to do. So I, I think it's very important to kind of connect and then get to know. And then what we think and what they think is quite different as well too. And then it's important to maybe, you know, kind of reach out to someone in the, our colleague in the university, what was their experience? And then, and then kind of reaching out actually native Indian study kind of department kind of actually understand that there's a system. I, I shouldn't say system, but it needs to get the more understanding. My case is the, my kind of historical knowledge was uh, not good <laughs> regarding the native Indian kind of world, the indigenous group. So that was actually kind of big step that I'm going. And then really consulted the several faculties or the scientists who already work with before actually really contacting the, the tribe members. It's like making friends. It's very organic. <laughs> That's a really good way of putting it, Sean Lam. Well, in fact, if, if I may jump in. Yes, go ahead, uh, Pat. I that's, saw you had your that's, hand. That's exactly what it is. I mean, if you think about relationships, and then if we are all relatives, then you are making a relationship that ideally is not just based on the transaction of doing the grant, but it arises from a connection that you have, even with a couple of phone calls where you show that you know the work that an office is doing. And so then you, you it's, it's it, with, with indigenous people, it's almost all social before it's work. And with us, it's work before it's social. So we have to have a reason to go to a meeting. We have to have these work-based things to do. And then after that, we go to happy hour. But I, I, I convened breakfasts with indigenous people for years before we started actually seeing what we might work together. And those conversations evolved out of getting to know each other and being, as you say, making friends. And now we're, you know, we, we have these relationships that extend beyond a work project. Now, not everybody has all that time, but at least you can, as a scientist, learn what the research agendas are for Glyphwick or for an agency and understand that if you're reaching out to them, it's exactly like if somebody just sort of bombarded you with an email saying, hey, I don't know anything about your work, but I hear it's good, let's do something. You'd hate that. Same thing. Take my hand down now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Pat, and yeah, thanks for those answers. I think that, that was really helpful and useful. Uh, well, again, I want to thank our, our speakers. Uh, another round of applause for them. Uh, this was, I think, fascinating talk, really helpful and illuminating in, in a lot of ways, not only about the science, but how the science can be enhanced with these, these relationships and, and uh, also addressing some of these uh, the, the longstanding issues and challenges we, we need to address with tribal nations. Um, the Tracy Fallon posted a, a note in the chat that there's a recording of this. This is being recorded right now. And after the video gets processed, it'll be posted on the Headwaters Lecture website, uh, which you can, web page, which you can find on the WRC website. And uh, once again, um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I hope the WRS 
um, prospective students enjoy the rest of your have been enjoying your virtual visit and enjoy enjoy the rest of it and enjoy the rest of the day everyone thank you everyone thank you, thank you crystal thank you Chandlin. you guys did awesome and thank you ed <laughs>